Well, it's good to see you, and it's good to be here today. Uh, we lo- you need to be seated. Yeah. Uh, we love your pastors. We love this church. And uh, since I was here last, I have taken a part-time position at, at our home church, and I'm primarily a teaching pastor and helping the church develop a very strong connection and simulation ministry. And the role of the pastor has allowed me to uh, the role he's given me is, allows me to stay in my sweet spot and provides a lot of flexibility. And when I told him about this opportunity to preach here, I said, I don't know whether I should go or not. I love Pastor Chad. I love it's one of, Reach Church is really one of my favorite places to ever preach because uh, there's such incredible freedom here. And I told him what Pastor Chad wanted me to do, and he said, you're doing it. You have to go. So anyway... My pastor was gracious enough to let me come and share with you. And I understand you're in a series called Money Matters, and I'm going to flow with that theme. And I'm titling the message, Money Matters and Kingdom Priorities. And I want to talk to you about bringing all money matters in alignment with kingdom priorities and what that will do for an individual and for a church. And... And honestly, I have no problem talking about money, and here's why. God talks a lot about money in the Bible. There are more than 500 verses on prayer in the Bible. There are almost 500 verses on faith in the Bible. But you know there's more than 2,000 verses in the Bible dealing with money and possessions. Even Jesus talked more about money than he did heaven and hell. In 18 of the 38 parables, money was at the heart of the issue. So clearly, from a Bible standpoint, money matters are important to God. Now, here's the starting place. We're going to start with Matthew 6, 33. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Now, if you read the entire chapter, when Jesus says all things, he literally means all things. Everything you need to sustain your life and be, live an abundant life, he is willing to provide. In Matthew 6, you have a promise and you have a premise. My part, my part is to put God first in all my money matters. If I do that, then God does his part, which is to provide for me. So when you align your money matters with kingdom priorities and you learn to manage your resources that God has given you His way, He is going to bless you. What I want to do today is look at three passages of Scriptures that highlight the proper use of money. And as we do, I want you to ask yourself this question. Is embracing kingdom priorities in money matters, is this an obligation or is it an opportunity? The first passage we're going to look at comes from Malachi 3. It's a classic chapter, you know, on tithing. Uh, But this is where embracing kingdom priorities begin. But it is a classic chapter on tithing. Well, what is a tithe? A tithe is 10%. The Scripture teaches us that we present the first 10% of our income to God. We do that to honor Him with the first fruits of our income. So if a person makes a dollar a week, their tithe is 10 cents. If they make $100 a week, the tithe is $10. If they make $1,000 a week, the tithe is $100. Well, let's read it. Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you do not have enough room for it. I'll present pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. There's always some people that will read that passage and they say, well, that's Old Testament. We're not required to tithe today. That's not the real issue. The real question is, does this principle and does this promise of Malachi 3 still work? Why wouldn't it work? You know, just because a principle or a promise 
is not restated in the New Testament exactly the same way it's stated in the Old Testament, that doesn't mean it doesn't apply. What about Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? You know, God promises if we trust Him with all of our heart, we lean not on understanding, we acknowledge Him in all of our ways, He'll direct our paths. Right. Well, guess what? Right. That Scripture is not restated in the New Testament. Yet we readily accept the premise and the promise of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 as being relevant for today. Yeah. So the point I'm making is you can't start picking and choosing which promises in the Bible you're going to believe and which ones you're going to disregard. Now, it's true we're not under the law, but the principles that God has given us, the promises He's given us in both the Old and New Testament are relevant in the 21st century. The reasons for tithing today are the same reasons that people of God tithed in the Old Testament. Now, very quickly, I want to give you three reasons for the tithe. For one, the tithe was brought to the place of worship to provide for the work of the Lord. And, and it ensured there was adequate support to carry on the work of the Lord. God's work today is just as worthy of support as it was in Old Testament times. The truth is we have a much greater commission. Jesus told us to go and make disciples of every nation. So to reach everyone with the gospel, God's work requires support. The tithe was also to prove God's faithfulness. God's got many attributes. Attributes such as love, justice, mercy, and faithfulness is one of them. He wants you to bring the tithe, the place of worship, so you can see his faithfulness in your life. Yes. And finally, the tithe is to honor God for his blessings on your life. Yeah. Every time I present my tithe to God, I'm making a very powerful faith declaration. It's like you're saying, God, I recognize you're the source of my life. Man does not live by bread alone. And I choose to honor you by bringing you the first fruits of my income. Giving to God on a regular basis is a powerful reminder that God is a source of all we have. Has anyone ever told you you don't really own anything? You really don't. Because the Bible says the whole earth, the fullness thereof belongs to God. So he owns it all. We are simply stewards over what he has provided us. Honoring God with the tithe week after week, it helps us keep our focus on Him and live in dependence on Him. Now, let's quickly examine what God promises to do when we bring the tithe into the storehouse. If you're having financial problems, you're going to be encouraged. And here's why. God loves you. God loves you with a passion. He is for you. He's not against you. And the good news is... God has a plan to lead you out of financial stress to a place of financial peace and blessing. Yeah. Now, here's what you can expect from God if you tithe. And I didn't make this up. God said this in his word. Yeah. One, God opens the windows of heaven. And the scripture specifically says, if you bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, which is the local church, he opens the windows of heaven over your life. And I can tell you, I would prefer living under an open heaven than a closed heaven every day. Yes. It's good to live under an open heaven. And the scripture even indicates that God will pour out a blessing greater than your need. Now, I do want to make something clear. I'm not saying if you tithe, God's going to make you a millionaire. Right. However, you can expect God to richly bless you. Here's what we need to understand about biblical prosperity. Biblical prosperity is having my needs met and me being able to be generous. Right. It's being able to give as God directs me. But based on Malachi 3, you cannot deny the fact God wants to bless you. And then number two, there will be a demonstration of God's power in your life when you honor him with the tithe. God says, prove me now in this. Only place in the scripture God has ever invited us to prove him. And he, it's like he says, I dare you. I dare you to prove me in this. When you tithe, God will move in your life and in your finances. 
He will move in both natural and supernatural ways to prove His power. And then third, God promises divine protection on our resources. Living in the world that we do, I want all the protection I can get. Now, here in Malachi 3, God says He'd rebuke the devourer for their sakes. And in the passage, God also told the people that the pests would not devour their crops, nor would their vines cast their fruit before their time. Their crops represented their resources, their income, and God, God promised protection on them. You and I may not have crops, but the principle applies. The principle is God will provide protection on our resources. Yes. In 1989 was when Pam and I assumed the pastorate of a church that had gone some, through some very difficult days, and it was on the verge of closing. And, of course, the financial picture was bleak. Having a strong administrative background, the first thing I want to do is review the church's financial records of the last two years. And what I discovered was, as the church faced increasingly financial pressures, they were giving less and less to world missions. And this was my conclusion. Churches and individuals can take themselves out of God's financial plan. And if you do, it's always to your detriment. As I was considering all this, and again, the situation was so bleak, there was no hope but God. I mean, our district was going to close the church and sell the property. I thought, our only hope is that the Holy Spirit brings life to this place. And God said to me, if you will take care of this church's business, I will take care of the church's business. And that principle is true for the church as well. See, if you and I will take care of God's business. He'll always take care of our business. Right. Well, what is God's business? Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost. I knew that we had to get involved in reaching people in our community and around the world, make that a priority. The very first thing that we did was begin to give a minimum 10% to world missions. And it had to come first before we paid any bills. Honoring God's plan will always bring blessing to an individual, and even to an organization. And honestly, the results were dramatic. As the church started giving 10%, <clears throat> it brought life to the church. Financial miracles started happening to meet the church's weekly obligations. The very first week we did this, the church had a large insurance payment due, which was $1,000. Now, that may not seem like a lot of money, but it is when you have nothing you know, that was a lot of money. And I do know this, $1,000 in 1989 represented a lot more money than $1,000 does in 2021. Right. But in the face of lack, we put God first. And it, it, it was a risk. And the Sunday before the insurance payment was due, a man was traveling to the Tulsa area on business, very successful businessman. Never met him before in my life. Didn't even live in the area. Of all the places he could show up on a Sunday morning is a small, struggling church in the area. He shows up, worships with us, and he gave a $1,000 offering, covered the insurance payment, never saw him again. What was God doing? Proving his faithfulness. God began sending people to the church. In September 89, the church had only 40 people, men, women, and children. By December of that year, we had 100. Now, you, you, that may seem insignificant, but in three months, we more than doubled. Yeah. And, and, and there were such miraculous stories of how people found the church and were experiencing God the first time they came in the building. The church was on the path to revitalization, and monthly giving began to soar. And in the beginning, it was just Pam and I on staff, and we were doing everything from preaching, teaching, cleaning, preparing bulletins, visitation, and so much more. But now because God was blessing the church financially, we started expanding pastoral staff, and it'd be due to the increased growth. And the more we gave to God, the more he blessed the church. But here's the picture I want you to get. Fast forward to 2018, the church that was on the verge of closing in 1989 with only 40 people was now a congregation of over 500 
with six full-time staff members and a janitor. Thank God for the janitor. <laughs> They're probably the most supportive person on staff. And now this church, the district was going to close, was now in the 300 top mission-giving churches in the nation within our denomination. All we did as an organization was start tithing. It wasn't because I was some charismatic, brilliant leader. We just got in God's financial plan, and he began to bless the church. And what I found was God did open the windows of heaven over the church and brought blessing every way. And he did that for individuals within the church as well. And, and so for me, tithing is not a law. It is life. Yeah. And this principle works for both an individual and an organization. Yeah. So the question I would ask you in a lot of Malachi 3 is embracing kingdom priorities in money matters. Is it an obligation or is it an opportunity? On the authority of God's word, I would have to include, uh, conclude that giving to God is my opportunity to be blessed. Now I want to turn our attention to sowing generously above the tithe. And before I do, I want, to, I want to make something clear. The tithe is the starting place in embracing kingdom priorities in money matters. And I don't know if you really have ever gotten this, but you know you don't give the tithe. The tithe is not yours to give. The first fruits always belongs to God. And you look carefully at Scripture from beginning to end. God is a God of first fruits. And even when you read Malachi 3, it never tells you to give the tithe. You can't give something that's not yours. The Scripture specifically says we bring the tithe. See, we bring back to God a portion of, of what's already his. And we bring the tithe to the storehouse, which is a local church with no strings attached. Now, the next passage we're going to look at is from 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, where Paul is talking about sowing generously to God's kingdom. And so here, I'm going to primarily be talking about when we start giving above our tithe. But in, in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, Paul wrote, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each man should give what he's decided to give, but not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. God says if you sow generously, you're going to reap generously. If you give reluctantly, you give grudgingly, you give greedily, uh, <clears throat> you're not going to really receive the kind of blessings you desire from the Lord. But if I'm willing to give to God generously and in a right spirit, God is going to be generous with me. And I have found the more generous I am with God, the more generous He is with me. But here's something else we need to understand about this passage. The passage does not imply that any two people do the same thing. Generously for a 10-year-old might be a dollar a week. Generously for a college student could be $10 a week. Generously for someone else could be $100 a week. What I would encourage you to do is, Lord, what would you have me give above the tithe that will reflect a generous heart? If you ask him, the Holy Spirit will give you direction in your giving. He will do it every time. And remember, God loves a cheerful giver. Now, if you're not a cheerful giver, God still loves you. You understand that? God still, you know, God loves everybody. God loves cheerful givers, and he even loves grumpy believers. <laughs> he does. But I will tell you this, grumpy believers just don't walk in as much blessing. Now, very quickly, I want to consider what God promises for sowing generously above the tide. First, he says, you will have all you need at all times. Boy, that's a pretty powerful promise. You know, over and over in Scripture, God promises to meet our needs. He's going to meet the, your needs at the beginning of your life, in the middle of your life, and the end of your life. There's never going to be a season, there's never going to be a time in your life when God's love and power cannot reach you. He will provide for all of your needs now and far into the future. You know, a lot of people are fearful about the future. 
there's a lot of talk right now about the nation's economy, the problems with inflation, fear of a recession, and we may already be in one. And while you and I can be impacted by our nation's economy, we've got to realize we are part of a greater kingdom whose economy will not fail. Many, many years ago, I had the opportunity to teach at a pastor's conference in Kreve Rogue, Ukraine. And I was invited to preach at the church sponsoring the conference the following Sunday. And this was shortly after the fall of communism, after the fall of the Soviet Union, which had left their economy in shambles. And when it came time to receive the offering, this young man got up to give a testimony about God's faithfulness. And he talked about how his life had changed when he began bringing the tithe to God and giving offerings above his tithe. And now he had brought blessing into to his life and how God was providing. And his testimony moved me to tears. And it reminded me that God's promises are for every individual. And it doesn't matter what that nation's economy is. And, you know, and here their economy was in shambles. But this young man was honoring God with what he had and God was providing. And it serves as a reminder, while the kingdoms of this world will be shaken, and it will be, we can be part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. There is never a time God is unable to meet your needs. And then second, God promised to make all grace abound to you. You know, there are many scriptures that speak of God's grace. And it's a fact that we all face challenges that are beyond our abilities to meet. We always do. You know, there are hardships, there are mysteries, there are trials, there are challenges, there are heartaches, disappointments that just come because we live like on a fallen planet. This is in heaven. This is planet Earth. But what God promises is His grace is sufficient for every trial and in every season. There is something about sowing generously that releases more of God's grace into your life. Now, to answer this question, in light of 2 Corinthians 9, is giving generously to God an obligation or an opportunity? God says, you're going to have all you need at all times. And he says his grace will abound to you. That doesn't sound like an obligation. It sounds like if I give generously to God, I'm the one that's blessed. It's an opportunity to be blessed by God. Now, this passage took on more meaning for me in the early 1990s. Uh, I've been teaching the congregation the importance of honoring God with the tithe. The congregation embraced that principle. And the church was growing, uh, giving a minimum of 10% to world missions every week. And so we were well on the path to revitalization. I mean, we were living in open heaven, and God was pouring out his blessing. But now the Holy Spirit began to challenge me to teach people to give above and beyond the 10%. And, and as I said, the church, um, as I said, you know, for us, the tithe was the starting place in Money Matters. But what we did was begin to have a yearly missions emphasis, and we would encourage people, we want you to give the world mission program of the church above the tithe. And the congregation embraced the truth in God's word, and people began to give their tithe, but they also began to give to world missions above their tithe, and they gave above their tithe in building program after building program after building program. In all honesty, when... The congregation, when all of us individually, we began giving above our tithe, that's when we saw the greatest miracles in the life of the church. And God was proving himself. And there was a time the whole church stepped into what I call faith level giving. We were in this building program. And we were asking people to make commitments above their tithe for a three-year period of time. And we discovered in that emphasis there were three levels of giving. First, there's reason giving, and this is where you can decide what you can give above your tithe for this kingdom project. Second, there's sacrificial giving, and this is where you consider what can you give up 
in order to support this kingdom endeavor. But finally, there's a faith level kind of giving where the Holy Spirit speaks to you and tells you what he wants to give through you. And I will guarantee you this, when the Holy Spirit tells you what he can give through you, it'll always be beyond what you could ever do on your own. It's to take you into something supernatural, miraculous. But there was a season where the Holy Spirit was speaking and revealing to all of us what we were to give above our tithe to this building program. And obedience to the Holy Spirit's voice, it released financial miracles into the church unlike any time I had ever seen. And for the next several years, we had testimonies almost weekly of financial miracles. Many received incredible raises, new jobs, new opportunities, business owners prospers. Over time, I mean, people who were in debt were now financially free. And we discovered as God has blessed us, suddenly we had more money to give. And what was so amazing, we were already challenged to give what the Holy Spirit put on our heart. And he enabled us to give even more than that. And and my major takeaway from all that was this. If God can get money through you, he will get money to you. Now, let that sink in. I mean, if, if God can get money through you, he will get money to you. But God was literally giving us money to give for this kingdom endeavor. But when it was all said and done, You know, we learned that God working through us had enabled us to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we had prayed or even thought about. Now, finally, I come to the last passage that I want to consider that relates to money matters. And this is what Jesus said in Luke 6, 38. Jesus says, give and it'll be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. What does Christ promise in regard to our giving? Two things. He says, number one, when you give, God's going to give to you. And and what is interesting in this passage, uh, Jesus does not tell us what to give or how much to give, but he just tells you whatever you give to God, God is going to give back to you. God's not going to be in debt to any man. Do you understand that? He, he's going to give to you. Now, I want to illustrate this for you. Let's say here's a guy that's got a horrible attitude about life and about people. And he builds a wall around himself. That wall seems to say, leave me alone. How much love do you think that guy's going to receive? Well, the Bible says you give and it should be given you. Well, if you don't give love, you're not going to receive love. But on the other hand, here's another guy that's just very open. He's pouring out love. I mean, he genuinely loves and cares about other people, constantly reaching out, wanting to be a friend. How many people are going to love that guy? A lot of folks are going to love him. Do you want friends? The Bible says if you want friends, you show yourself friendly. If you're willing to be a friend, you're going to have a friend. But the principle that Jesus gives us is whatever you give, love, time, friendship, service, money, is all going to come back to you. And then second, Jesus says that when God gives back, he gives abundantly. And I'm not making this up. Jesus said this. God takes your gift somehow and he multiplies it. And Jesus says when you give to God and God gives back, What God gives back comes back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Now, those words speak of abundance and multiplication. Our God is a God of abundance and multiplication. There is no limit to what he can give you and how much he can bless you. Now, I want to inject a thought here. Never let your resources determine your destiny. Never. And looking back, you know, we've been serving the Lord. You know, we've been in ministry now for about 45 years. But, you know, looking back over a 45-year ministerial career, God has blessed us so. But I'm going to tell you, if Pam and I had ever made our decisions based on our resources, we'd have never taken a step of faith. 
and we wouldn't have the blessings that we have today. Three times in my life, God asked me to walk away from financial security, to leave where we were in faith, and follow him to the next assignment that he would show us. And every time, God, every time he required me to step out in faith, no lie, my salary was always reduced by 50%. I never had the luxury. You know, the, I never understood, you know, these people interview for these jobs, have several job opportunities. Well, you know what? This job pays the most, but this one's got this benefit, and this one's got this. Oh, no. God said, here's a great door for you for an effectual work. The benefits, oh, everything is cut in half, 50%. But the benefit is you get to live in dependence on me and see what I can do. And I'm telling you, we have walked that road. We've stepped out into places that we literally had nothing to depend on but God. But when we stepped out, I want you to hear me. It was always based on a word and word from heaven. It, it does concern me sometimes when I hear people talk about, well, I'm going to take this step of faith, or I'm going to take this step of faith. Hey, you don't want to presume on God. You presume on God, you're going to get in trouble. But what I mean by that is, Whatever steps you take, they need to be prompted by the Holy Spirit. So the steps we were taken were prompted by a word from heaven. And thank God, our track record proves that we did hear from God in those instances. Even our daughters have said, Mom, Dad, some of the things you did were really kind of crazy. But evidently it was God because here's the result. And I went, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of things you can build on faith. You can build a marriage on faith. You can build a life on faith. You can build a business on faith. A lot of things you can build on faith, but you cannot build anything on a fantasy. So you've got to have a word from heaven. But I will tell you this. God always came first, and our money matters. It always did. I was not brought up in a church that taught tithing. They taught stewardship. You just kind of gave to God whatever he put on your heart. So when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I was in graduate school, and I'd not been taught to tithe. I didn't know what that was. And so I get filled with the Holy Spirit, and I got paid, and I, I mean, I didn't make a lot of money. I'm in graduate school trying to put myself through, through school, and I got paid, and I had this overwhelming feeling I was to give 10%. And I thought, where is that coming from? And, and, and it was so strong, and I, I mean, I can't tell you, I was just compelled. I thought, I'm to give 10% of this check to God. And I started doing that. And then, you know, then by this time, I changed churches, and I was in a spirit-filled church, and that began to teach on the tithe, and I thought, wow, the Holy Spirit's smart. He knew about tithing. <laughs> yeah. And it's in the Word. You know, the Holy Spirit gave me something in the Word. He always does. He wrote the Word, you know, and it's amazing how He can lead us. And, he, and, you know, here I didn't even have the knowledge of that. But what does the Holy Spirit do? He leads us into truth, and that truth is in the Word. But, you know, we just always put God first, and money matters, and He blessed us. And even in the church I was pastoring, God did some amazing things financially. You know, by 1994, the church had outgrown its facility, uh, the facility was not serving the congregation at all. I mean, we need to remodel. We need to expand. And while the first church finances were growing, and, and we had no promise meeting weekly obligations, and we were adding staff, I mean, we didn't have a dime for a building project. And the first phase was going to be something like $750,000. Now, again, put that in perspective. For a congregation of 200, and in the 1990s, that, that's a tremendous amount of money. And that, that project was overwhelming for a small congregation. But we made a commitment that we would not let our lack of resources determine our destiny. And so we decided we'd let the vision of God be our guiding force. And that's true for you, and it's true for this church. But see, God's vision has to be the guiding force of your life and the guiding force of every church that calls on his name. But one of the things I discovered, you know, here we had no money for a building program, but we sensed that this was our destiny. You know, the only thing we had to give God was a yes. 
And you know, with God, I found a yes is good enough. And God took our yes, he took our willingness, and then he began to make everything possible. And all I know is we were generous with God individually and as a church, God was so generous with us. And he enabled us to pay off a very expensive building program in less than five years. Now, I want to ask you this question. Based on what Jesus said in Luke 6, 38, is embracing kingdom priorities in your money matters, is that an obligation or is it an opportunity? Jesus says, if you give, God's going to give back to you and in abundance. So I'll look at all three of these passages, and I would have to say in the authority of God's word, giving to God is never an obligation. It is an always an opportunity for you and I to be blessed. Just a couple things I want to mention as I wrap this up that I have found helpful in receiving from God. For one, I would encourage you, when you tithe and you give offerings above your tithe, you expect God to keep his word. If these promises are not true, why are we even here? You know, if these promises aren't true, how can you believe anything else in the Bible? The Bible is true. And these principles have been tested and proven by millions throughout the ages. But as you embrace kingdom priorities in all your money matters, you trust God to keep his word. And then I would encourage you, see the God of the Bible as he really is. Base your vision on God based on what is revealed in Scripture. And all through Scripture, from Genesis through Revelation, we see God as generous. There's nothing stingy about God. And the Scripture reveals a God of abundance, a God of much, a God of love, a God of grace, and a God who absolutely delights in providing for the needs of his children, a God that delights in giving good gifts to his children. He is a God who wants to prosper and bless us, and he'll do it in natural and even in supernatural ways. But the truth is, your loving Heavenly Father wants to give to you. And when we embrace kingdom priorities in our money matters, it's always our opportunity to be blessed by God. You know, it all starts with the tithe. I mean, you look at all of God's promises just with the tithe alone. You know, step out of it in faith by bringing the whole tithe to God, no strings attached, and you give God the opportunity to prove himself. And then as we grow in the Lord, he wants us to learn to be generous and give offerings above the tithe. And based on what is revealed in Scripture, again, I conclude it is good to be generous with God. And all I know is the more generous my wife and I have been with God, the more generous he's been with us. We have always sowed where we wanted to go. We always have. Yeah, I remember days I would pray, God, I really need to make this amount of money. And you know what I would do? I would start tithing as though I made that. I, I, I tithed in faith. I mean, there was one time we were, we, were, we were really struggling. We were The church was on the path of revitalization, but we weren't catching up. We were struggling financially and making a lot of sacrifices to be where we were. And I told the Lord, Lord, we, we've just got to have this much money a week if we're going to ever start a family, if we're going to ever have a home and be able to feed kids. You know, we're going to have to have this much money a week. And I remember the Lord said, well, you, you tithe on that. And as though you're making that. You call those things that been as though they were. Now, I wouldn't encourage you to take the word God gave me and make it your own. Okay? Are you with me? You can't. Don't, don't ever do that. Now, if the Holy Spirit gives that to you, that's one thing. But I went to my wife and I said, this is what God told me to do. And she said, how are we going to survive? And I said, well, we've come this far. All I know to do is let's, let's do it. And let's see what God will do. And after I tithed and what we were supposed to, what I wanted to make, and then we paid taxes, we had fifteen dollars to live on that week, and our rent was due. And I remember I said, "God, I'm doing what you told me to do. I need you to show yourself faithful. I'm expecting you to show up." And I thought we need seven 
$100. I went to the mailbox that day, and there was a check from a family in Texas that said, God spoke to us last week that you would need $700. Here's the check. We saw so many miracles like that. So many miracles. Now, as the church prospered, and the church began to bless us and pay us a good salary. You know, we didn't see as many of those financial miracles because God was providing for us through his church. But we know what it is to trust God and to be generous with God. And, you know, it just comes down to this. Just trust him with your entire life. Just trust him, not just with your money matters, but with your entire life. Yeah, it doesn't mean you're never going to face some problems or some challenges or some heartaches. But see, what sets us all apart is we have a source to depend on that helps us to overcome everything the world may throw at us. But just give Him your whole life. And, and maybe there's someone here this morning and you're thinking, you know what, life really isn't working for me. And maybe you have not trusted Him with your whole life life. I'll tell you this, the moment you put your trust in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sin, you are what the Bible calls born again. And you may still be on this earth, but you are now part of an eternal kingdom that will never end. And your Father in heaven wants to care for you. I'd like everybody just to bow their head for a minute, close your eyes. If there's someone here and you sense the Holy Spirit is dealing with you and encourage you to trust Christ with your life, would you just quickly raise your hand? I would, I would love to pray with you. I never want to assume that everyone I'm talking to is right with God. But I also want to pray for just everyone here to embrace God's plan for your life and certainly for your financial picture. You know, we don't know what's coming in our future. We don't know what's coming to this country. But we can be a part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And he rules and he reigns even over the kingdoms of this world. And God is able to meet your needs. And if you have some pressing need this morning, especially a financial one, God's got a plan to meet that need. And I want to encourage you to trust him. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you can be trusted. You can be trusted to keep your word. And you have been faithful to people throughout the generations. You are faithful. And every word from God is flawless. Your word is true. And God, we choose to trust you. And I, I just pray everyone here will, will in their heart, will say yes to you today. Yes to you in, in everything. Yes with their life. Yes to you for direction. Yes to you in money matters. And God, all I know is when we put you first in every area of our life and certainly in money matters, you take care of your children. And I pray we'll never see giving as an obligation but it's our opportunities to be blessed by a faithful God. And I thank you, Lord, that you're going to prove yourself faithful. If there are those in this congregation that are struggling financially, then I pray your Holy Spirit's going to show them the plan. And I know that you can lead them to a place of financial peace and blessing. But thank you. You're the God that can meet all of our needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And in your son's glorious name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching the Reach Church YouTube channel. Stay connected with us on Facebook and Instagram. Hit the subscribe button and share this video with a friend. You can also support the ministry by visiting reachchurch.us give to help us continue reaching and equipping people. Thanks again for watching and God bless.